Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Talk to Tom. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells, and this show is my favorite time of the week. We started Talk to Tom back in 2004 during the hurricane season, just talking to you, the viewer at home. People calling in with questions, we were able to answer them on TV live. We would zoom in on radar and show people what was about to happen, answer your questions. It's all grown from that into this show that you're seeing today. Every Thursday afternoon between 5.30 and 6, we take viewer questions, answer those, and try to have a cool guest on as well. Uh, later today, in the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about something that impacts our weather and our environment that you may not ever think about. One of those things you never think about, concrete. Concrete has a big impact on our environment, from the manufacturing to the use of it. We'll explain more about that in the second half of this show. Let me now talk to you about your questions. Remember, you can always submit a question anytime on clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Let's go and dive in. Our first question comes to us from our friend named John Wilson. John says, some mornings I have dew on my car and other mornings I don't. I know there's a relationship between dew point and humidity. What causes more moisture when there is dew on the window and other days not? John, thank you for the question. Uh, there is a difference between dew point and relative humidity. Relative humidity builds up anytime the temperature starts to drop. Relative humidity is how much humidity the air can hold relative to it being full. So if you have the air spread apart and you have 10 holes for air to fit in and then the air cools down and collapses and all of a sudden you only have five holes for the air to fit in, your humidity went up by 50%. So your relative humidity went from about zero, let's say, just for example, to 50%. And then when it continues to cool and the air comes together even more, all of a sudden there's nowhere for the humidity to go. And the humidity increases to 100% or 80% relative to what it can hold. When the temperature drops low enough at the current pressure, that the relative humidity hits the 98, 99, 100 percentile, that's when you get dew. When all of a sudden you hit the dew point, dew will start to collect on your car. So it's not really a difference between the air being totally dry, because it can still be humid with that dew on your car. It's how low the temperature goes with moisture in the air. And so what's happening to you is that some days the temperature drops enough that the dew forms, and other days the temperature stays just above the dew point. So the relative humidity never hits into the 90 percentile to form that dew. Okay, that's the quick answer. Just know that we have moisture in the air almost always, most especially this time of year. But if the temperature doesn't drop just low enough to hit the dew point to where the atmosphere can hold no more moisture, then you won't get the dew. It's the difference between the temperature. It's really creating dew or not creating dew. All right, next up. Our friend's name is Laura Sands. First of all, love your show. Thank you, Laura. Love you too, kid. All right. Not sure if this is really a weather question or not. Maybe more curiosity. I like how accurate your radar views are daily. But I've always wondered, what does the radar imaging show when a rocket goes up the coast? Oh, maybe other space nerds like me would love to see that as well. Thanks, Tom. Have a great day. Okay. It depends on how quick we are in cranking up the game and how much is coming out of the particular rocket. Sometimes if it's a huge rocket launch, we'll get a little stream and um, we can see it on the satellite or crank the gain up and pick it up on radar both. Sure can, sure can. A visible satellite shot will pick up a contrail of a rocket and sometimes our radar can pick up something going on at the Cape too. Sure can. It picks up birds. Uh, we can crank the radar gain up way up and pick up bugs, sometimes a big bug migrations all of a sudden or bats. I've seen people who live in areas like Austin, Texas that have a huge bat problem. When the bats fly out at night, they can crank the gain up on the radar and track the bats flying out of the tunnels, that sort of thing. So it's possible that we could crank the radar up and maybe see a contrail or a uh, eruption of the moisture coming out of the rocket. I'll try to do that for you, space nerd. Um, and we love space nerds like you. And I appreciate you living here and I appreciate all your questions from Brevard County. Next up comes to us from our friend, Cheryl Check. What can Central Florida expect in the form of future weather conditions now that El Nino is setting up? Okay, Cheryl, first of all, yes, 
Uh, the announcement came just recently from NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, that El Nino is game on. We think it's going to be a strong El Nino, maybe as strong as the one we had back in 2012, maybe as strong as one that we had back in like, mm, I think it was 97, 98. Um, for the purposes of hurricane season here in Central Florida, to shut down most hurricane production, we want El Nino. So our biggest impact that we get during the summertime is the impact of the westerlies coming across the country from El Nino, from the Pacific warming, the westerlies set up and basically shear the tops off of most Atlantic storms or slow down the production of the Atlantic hurricane season. That's the thing we look forward to. That's the thing we want. We love that. Problem is this year, the ocean is so warm globally and most especially across the Gulf and the Atlantic Basin that it's we're not sure whether the shearing effect of the El Nino is going to be enough to shut down production numbers. We hope so. So we're calling for just below normal numbers in the hurricane season. That's the first big impact. The other big impact is normally we're drier than normal during an El Nino and we've been dry in spots for a couple of months on end. Third thing I want you to be aware of is that as much as I love El Nino for the summer, we really don't like El Nino for the winter. And here's the thing, with that westerly track set up in the atmosphere, all of a sudden, something like a Colorado wave cyclone that would go across the country and up into the Great Lakes from Colorado, those lows come, re come racing right straight across the Gulf of Mexico in the winter time. Not the summer, but the winter. Impacts on winter, totally different than impacts on summer. So all of a sudden we have an El Nino. Everything is traveling zonally from west to east across the Gulf. And we get storm after storm after storm in the winter here in central Florida. That leads us to some wacky weather. Normally, anytime there's a pocket of low pressure in the Gulf of Mexico, things get to rocking here on our state. And that is the case during El Nino winters. We get bigger winter storms. And by winter storms, I don't mean snow and, and ice. I mean rain, thunderstorms, and twisting wind in the form of tornado outbreaks. When you think about the big tornado outbreaks that you remember back in the 90s, um, back in the early 2000s, the Groundhog Day tornado, um, all of that came during an El Nino winter. Sure did. So just know that impacts for the summer are totally different than impacts for the winter. Impacts for the summer tones our storms down. Impacts for the winter cranks our storms up, which is really a bummer. Okay, next question. This one comes to us from Tim Carney. Tim says, I am an earth sciences teacher. I understand that in low pressure air rises and in high pressure air sinks, correct Tim. It's always confused me why in general sinking air is normally good weather, sunshine, and low pressure rising air results in clouds, rain, storms, including hurricanes. In addition, the lower the pressure, the more clouds, rains and strength of the storms. Put it into layman terms so I can easily understand. Well, Tim, you did a pretty good job there. But what's going on is that anytime we have high pressure, the air is sinking from aloft. And when air sinks, it warms and dries out. And so if we have high pressure, yes, the air is coming down. That's high pressure forcing air down, feeling more pressure on the ground, on your body with the air coming down. It spreads out. Clouds cannot form as they come down. They form from lifting air. So at high pressure with air sinking, the air is drying out and usually warming. Could be we have a winter high pressure center that puts cold air down, sinking cold air, no moisture. But um, high pressure does normally mean clear skies and sunshine. Okay, pockets of low pressure mean cloud cover because the higher, the lower the pressure, things start to lift. And as they lift, they cool. And when air cools, the molecules come together, the clouds form, and that's why it gets cloudy produces rain and then leads to bigger storms. That's it in layman's terms. It's not really difficult at all. The more the air lifts, the more it cools, water droplets come together and form the clouds to produce the rain. Hope that helped. All right, thank you so much for your questions. Anytime you wanna submit a question, I'd love to hear from you, the viewer at home. Just submit it to us on clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. You could even send it in video if you want and we'll put you on video wise too. Coming up next, we're going to talk to someone about some of the most popular building materials on our coast being made better so that our sea life can have a better life. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Talk to Tom. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. If you're just now tuning in, earlier in the show, we answered your questions, which is the whole basis for the show of Talk to Tom is your questions. Send them in. Here in the second half of the show, I want to concentrate on something that impacts the coastline that maybe you don't think about too often. And what I'm talking about today is concrete. Usually when you think of the coast, you think of sand and water, but a whole bunch of concrete also helps to separate the ocean from the land. And now, a company is working to make sure that that barrier is more eco-friendly than ever. Marine biologist and e-concrete co-founder Dr. Edo Sella is here to join us to talk more about it. Dr. Sella, welcome to Talk to Tom. How are you, man? All good. All good. Happy to be here, Tom. Good. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're with us today. I'm very interested in concrete, and people normally don't think of it as any type of green issue or... Um, atmospheric issue but let's dive into it how did you start e-concrete what made you do that um, actually i'm a marine biologist uh, focusing on the impact of uh, uh, coastal construction on the marine environment and i did did it from doing this from for the last 20 years um, at a certain point it was 10 years ago uh, we myself and my co-founder uh, decided to step out of the academy and and basically with the aim of bridging development sustainability and that was the aim of e-concrete of developing uh, technologies that can be applied by the industry in order to build in a more responsible way um, infrastructure that will be able to support ecosystem services such as biodiversity, carbon sequestration, nursery ground, and, and others. Okay, um, helping the environment's a big deal here on Talk to Tom. We do a, a focus feature every Thursday called Forecasting Change. It's all about what's going on with our global climate. Um, not just everyone always worries about, oh my gosh, we're getting hot, but Climate change is not always we're getting hot. A lot of it is the sea levels rising. Uh, there's huge tropical downpours and all that climate change encompasses. Concrete, I, I never thought of that before about a year and a half ago when I learned that the manufacturing of concrete actually is kind of hard on the environment. But you guys have come up with new ways of thinking about it or new ways of doing it. Um, without violating copyright contract and giving away all your secrets. What's the difference between your concrete and others? So concrete, which is the second most consumed materials on earth after water, is responsible for 8% of uh, um, CO2 emissions. And it's responsible and it's, it's basically the base material for 70% of coastal marine infrastructure worldwide. And I'm talking about bridge foundations and waterfronts and breakwaters and seawalls and marinas and, and piers and key walls, et cetera. So for, the reason it's, it's, it's uh, so widely consumed because it's widely available in, in different regions of the world. It's, it's really uh, a great materials to work for in, in coastal construction and marine construction in terms of durability and applicability, but there is the associated CO2 footprint. And there's another thing. And the other thing is that usually concrete infrastructure is associated with a negative impact on the marine environment. Um, as we decided to step into this industry as marine biologists dealing with concrete, the aim was to do the shift and, and to think how can we apply technology that would reduce the negative impact of concrete. At the same time, the industry itself was dealing with reducing the CO2 emissions of concrete and associated with concrete and applying materials into the concrete mix and in different ways that the concrete is cast and manufactured from the cement down to the concrete that will reduce those emissions. Well, how does it help marine life? When you, when you talk about it, um, how much concrete there is impacting the oceans, you said it has a negative connotation or negative impact. How does e-concrete help the marine life? What, what do you mean by that? So, so standard concrete that is used for coastal construction is, mm -hmm. is usually an, a not suitable material, not the best material for biodiversity to grow, let's say a, a balanced community which means whatever you're gonna put in the water is gonna have biology growing on it. The big question is what type of biology? If it's gonna be invasive species, if it's gonna be the, the same biology and the organism that you see on the natural reef nearby. And usually that's not the case with concrete. With, with concrete. What we did in e-concrete is basically a technology that can be applied on the local concrete. So we don't provide concrete, we just provide technology and materials that are added into the local concrete, allowing the, the concrete to be neutralized chemically and by doing this, allowing the organisms to sell. What does it mean? It means that more corals will grow on the concrete, more oysters will grow on, on the concrete, and we actually can get the concrete balance almost as the natural reef nearby. Oh, so it starts to just become, instead of being, when you swim up, you won't be able to see it's just concrete. It'll, it'll grow 
and look like a, a reef maybe and have be teeming with marine life instead of being just a concrete wall. Exactly. Yes. exactly. And the benefits, of course, are for the environment, but also for the infrastructure itself, because there is a process that's called bioprotection. Those oysters and barnacles and tube worms that are growing on the substrate, they're actually protecting the concrete. And it was found that seawalls that are uh, uh, supporting uh, biology and life have a better longevity than standard seawalls. And, and actually now the standards for construction are calling to keep the fouling community on your structure because it's actually protecting it. Where can we find it in Florida? Are you using it all over our state or is it kind of isolated right now? One of our logistics centers is, is based in uh, uh, St. Petersburg. Um, oh. Last year, uh, we published a, a paper on, on, uh, on the large experiments that we did in uh, Port Everglades together with Nova University on, on how you can apply technology that will promote the growth of biology and ecosystem services in, in a, in a, in a long-term uh, pro uh, project that we did at the entrance to uh, Port Everglades. Uh, previous year, we worked in Key West, at the Federal Port of Key West and, and, and evaluating uh, the performance of the technology. Um, and we have now in the pipeline several projects in Florida that are looking to apply the technology. Okay, so do you come here, or you, as you said earlier, you, you don't always provide the concrete, you provide the technology. Are you here a lot working on stuff, or you work from afar? I'm based, with, the, the company is working internationally. Uh, we have uh, three hubs. One is Tel Aviv, the other one is Barcelona in Spain, uh, New York and Florida uh, that are working together. We have uh, team members that are based in Florida. Um, both coastal engineers and, and dealing with environmental uh, uh, permitting, etc. Um, but they work. But we work uh, um, in, in the entire U.S. We have project at the Port of San Diego and Port of San Francisco and, and in, wow. in New York waterfront, which is a, a chain of breakwaters that protecting the tip of Staten Island, uh, um, but because in, in on, on a town that's called Tottenville that suffered severe damage during Superstorm Sandy. Okay. That is that's basically protecting the shoreline. In New York is that we are des designed them ecologically, implemented e concrete technology on the construction and showed that we can significantly increase uh, the recruitment of uh, oysters, which is a target species in this area, but at the same time provide the protection that is needed to the shoreline. I, I'm fascinated by that breakwater. When you say um, you, you put the, the breakwater, it's almost like building a reef. Is that like um, above water? beneath water right up against the shore or, or could you describe it for me real quick yeah sure so uh, breakwater are basically uh, uh, structures that can mm -hmm. be either submerged or breaching out of the water that will be parallel to the beach wow. in a distance which is allowing them not to connect to the beach if there is a a, a growing beach so they would be, they, they're supposed to be always disconnected and basically break the waves before the waves are actually impacting the, uh, the beach. It can make a so, big difference. So those structures are usually a bit... both, right? I mean, a storm mm -hmm. surge coming that would help and break that up too. It's like a chain of uh, um, granulated uh, uh, structures okay. that allowing water to pass through them, but will reduce the, the force of the waves. So what they will basically protect, they will allow the waves, the actual energy of the wave to penetrate less into the land. Nice. And they will allow more sand to accumulate, and because one of the one of the major thing of, uh, on storms is that we're losing a large portion of the beach after every storm, which make us more sensitive for the next storm to come up. Uh, building a breakwater is keeping that sand and keeping the width of of the beach to protect the uh, the shore. Well, that's amazing. I can't thank you enough for explaining that to me, and thank you so much for being here, ladies and gentlemen. That was Dr. Sella from. E Concrete. You can check out Talk to Tom every Thursday afternoon between 5.30 and 6 right here on WKMG and stream us anytime, anywhere worldwide on News 6 Plus. See you next week. Bye.